Um, the funny thing is, I started cutting hair um, by by accident. Well, I I was inspired because my uncle actually owned two barbershops in Germantown. Um, I used to get my free haircuts since I was like seven all the way up to I was about like 15. Um, so I was just kind of always around the barber environment. Me actually cutting hair came um, when I was in eighth grade and um, a good friend of mine at the time, his name was uh, Bryant, rest in peace. Um, we was going to a party, you know, eighth grade kids going to this party. And he was like, you know, um, my sister has a pair of clippers. Can you shape me up? You know, since you already know how to draw. I was always drawing since a kid. So he was like, man, can you shape me up? You you know how to draw. And I'm like, ah, oh, man, I, I don't want to mess you up. It was, it was that challenge right there that kind of like first put the clippers in my hand. I started cutting hair um, in eighth grade. Ninth grade, I started getting nice. And literally in ninth grade, I was starting to cut, you know, um, some of the seniors um, and ju- juniors and seniors that was on like the football team. I went to Penwood High School at the time. So I was cutting seniors and juniors on the football team at Penwood High. That, so that was like eighth, ninth grade, cutting hair. During my, during my barber career, I, I was always an artist. I was always an artist, first and foremost. Um, it's, it's very funny. It's very funny, this relationship with barbering and art in my life. In 12th grade, we had to do a senior project. The senior project consisted of um, community service volunteer hours into um, a profession that you could see yourself doing after high school. I chose barbering, not because I wanted to be a barber, but because going into my earlier, you know, um, childhood stories, eighth and ninth grade, I was I was already cutting hair, you know, in my neighborhood. And um, so when the senior project came, it was just, yeah, I'm gonna do it because it was easy. Not because I wanted to be a barber, just because it was easy. All right, I gotta dedicate, you know, 50 hours to this. Um, so I chilled him. Um, I chose in a, in a barber shop. Funny thing is, um, uh, Marcus, um, you know, I am Mark. Uh, you know, he was he was my mentor at the time. Uh, at the, he was cutting in Derby at uh, what is it? Sharp Skills. I think that's the name of the shop. But um, yeah, so that project, that project kind of like catapulted me into like really taking barbering serious. Um, graduated high school, uh, worked at Strawbridge's, uh, in the China department, <laughs> suited up and everything, $6 selling fine China to old, old women. Um, it was crazy. Uh, and, and I remember getting paid $6 an hour, getting dressed up, having to cater to these, these people that didn't look like me that came in the store already thinking that I didn't know what I was talking about, but little did they know I, I, I sold the shit out of that stuff. Like, and I was one of the best sellers there. At the time, I was coming to and from work, and, and it was a barbershop in my neighborhood, and they had a help wanted sign. And I was cutting myself at the time, and I walked in there, and I went in there with the intended purpose of sitting in a chair just so I could get comfortable with them knowing me and me knowing them. And then I asked, Yo, I see a help wanted sign. What's up? They said, Do you have a license? I said, No, but I got clientele. You know what I mean? And um, and, and from there, I, I quit my job at Strawbridge's and never looked back. Um, was cutting hair for about 10 years. 10 years, um, I, of course, I finally got licensed. Um, but throughout that 10 years, I, I've also put myself through um, Art Institute of Philadelphia, studying media arts and animation, paying for that out of my barber money. Um, unfortunately, th- those bills got a little too high. So I had to, um, you know, I had to, you know, still pursue my art in other ways. It just wasn't, you know, collegiately. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't let that art side die. So um, the art, the art community started seeing, um, started seeing a, a big boom in, in, in creativity in the barber, in the barber scene. And um, and me and my cousin Kenny Duncan at the time. Uh, we were inspired by these portraits that were starting to happen by um, 
um, a, a few barbers that we knew that were doing them and, and me and Kenny was just like, we gotta take it to the next level. So we started having challenges, we started having bets and whoever, the, whoever lost the bet would have to get a face portrait put in the back of their head. That's how we started practicing. We started losing bets and we were practicing. So um, it, it went from these portrait challenges in the shop, um, getting confident, uh, um, knowing certain procedures, certain tricks and, and things like that that I did with the clippers um, on people's hair that allowed me to step out and say, you know what, I'm about to start doing competitions. So I started you know, applying it to join in competitions doing portraits. The, fir the first time I won, it was, it was crazy. The first time I won was at the Bonner Brothers, Bronner Brothers um, hair show in Atlanta. Super big, you know what I mean? It was, it was the first time I ever seen like that many of us, you know what I mean? Black folk, black excellence all in one building. And it was like, damn, yo, they doing it big, yo, like big. So I'm, I'm nervous now. And I, I signed up for two competitions. One was the Andes competition and I lost. I lost, um, it's not because my haircut wasn't good. It was just a lot of things I saw during the course of, of, of that Brother Brother weekend that I instantly like picked up and learned, like presentation. You know what I mean? Your, your wardrobe, everything was, was bigger than just the haircut. So on day one, I lost. Day two, I had my second competition. So um, I re-strategized and I actually won. I won in front of, you know, a couple thousand people at Bronner's and um, and I, I was just like, wow, you know, I, I want to be a part of this, of this industry on a bigger, in a bigger way. Um, so, yeah, that, that's 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 been like the, the, the ongoing, you know, relationship between my artwork and barbering is me using barbering to um to, to be a platform for me to express my creativity and my artwork. And, um, and I've done that very successfully. And now I'm full-time artist. And, it, and it's funny because I'm now using certain practices um, that I learned while barbering into my artwork, just as far as how to conduct business, customer service skills, um, presentation, things like that. So uh, those two careers definitely one hand washed out of them. Yeah. So a lot of people, a lot of people, I, I've developed a lot of good relationships um, with, you know, people in the industry, outside of the industry, and they knew me for cutting hair. And then they kind of said, whoa, what happened? What happened? He stopped cutting hair. He started doing art. Um, it got to a, it got to a point where um, and a lot I had I had these conversations with a lot of my coworkers at the time. Um, I started analyzing what I wanted my, my future to look like. And I loved cutting hair. I, I loved cutting hair. I never, I never desired to own a shop though. I never desired to own a shop. Um, but I loved cutting hair. I wanted, I couldn't see myself retiring the way I wanted to retire as a barber. Like I knew that barbering was a young man's game. You know, as you get older, your clients get older, and you can't be the 70-year-old dude still giving sharp-ass cuts to these young 20-year-olds. So I, I looked at it the, the longevity way. Um, at the time, there was uh, there was there was I was putting a lot of hours into the shop. My family life was was falling apart a little bit, um, and so I had to make a decision of, you know, what's more important to me at the time. You know, what I mean, my barber career or my family, and because I, I already had that, um, because I already had those thoughts of what what my future looked like past a certain age, and, and what I didn't want it to look like, it was kind of like, okay, I'm I'm 30, I'm young enough to like start a new path and still really be like as successful as I as I envision myself. So um, for me to step out on faith and kind of pursue the art you know, just all in. Um, it was hard. It was definitely hard. Um, but I think that, um, people that, people that have been following my art career, following my barber career, people that are really like, they see my heart and see, see my passion. They, they stuck, they stuck by, they're still supporters. Um, 
you know, they still come out to my shows. They still buy artwork. And and, and honestly, I'm glad I'm glad that I can make this transition the way I, I have because I see that I'm an inspiration to a lot of people. Um, barbers, a lot of barbers are starting like to open their eyes and collect artwork now or do artwork now, um, express themselves in other creative ways, so. I draw my balance, um, I draw my balance from my family and, and, and my wife particularly. I'm not even gonna lie, like, um, it's, a lot of people, it's funny, it's funny because a lot of people kind of look at me and say like, oh man, Chuck, you know, you, you're, you're this guy, you're that guy and you know, you great artist and everything. I don't, I don't see myself that way. You know what I mean? I don't see myself that way. I see, I see Chuck, um, I see Chuck doing a lot of great things in the barber career and then I see Chuck that has just newly entered this art world. And a lot of people put all that together. Me, I, I try not to because I'm very much still new to this this art game. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. I'm still I'm still finding my art voice. That's why I do a lot of things in collections because when you look at some other professional artists, like let's say Pablo Picasso, for instance, Pablo Picasso had over like eleven different styles throughout his course of his his career. I I left Barber and, and jumped straight into art. I've only been uh, art business for three years. So I don't have, I didn't have, you know, that 10 years of me cutting hair to discover what my art voice was. So a lot of people sit there and ask me for advice and things of that nature. And I'm like, I can't really give you advice. I can tell you my story, but I can't really give you advice because I'm not your typical artist. You know, um, I, I'm married with a with a wife that has a good job at the Philadelphia for the Philadelphia school district. At times when it's it's low for me, she can hold on to like you know what I mean maintaining the house. Then when my months come in and it's really good, then we then we move in. But I can't really give advice to someone else who might be single, got their own bills to take care of, it's solely like dependent on their artwork. Your struggles are completely different from mine. Um, so for me, I know that my balance, and I try not to take this for granted at all, is that I got a wife, I got a, a you know, my, she's my partner in this. Um, you know, it, it, we, we make it work. She believes in me. Um, she believes in, in, in me still being the leader of the household. And, um, and with this artist entrepreneur life, just like I try to tell every artist, you know, the struggling artist um, kind of like stigma is, is don't try to take that to heart. Look at yourself as an entrepreneur. And if you look at the numbers, a lot of entrepreneurs fail within their first five years. Everybody's struggling. Everybody's starving. So I try not to hold on to, oh, I'm a struggling artist. No, I'm a business person. I'm an entrepreneur. There will be hard times. You know what I mean? Me having my, my wife to counter balance you know those hard times those valleys that's that's where my balance comes from knowing that okay you know if, if, if yeah that's it it does feel crazy sometimes when um when people ask me what do i do for a living and i i reply like i'm an artist it's so it's so many there's so many artists out here that off of first reaction, people are like, oh, okay. And, and you can tell like their face is like, yeah, you don't, you don't know. Uh, <laughs> so for me, and it, it's so it's so funny. It, I'm gonna I'm give you a, a, a real quick example. I was out in uh, Montgomery County, for anybody that's that's watching this, and if you don't know what Montgomery County is, that's Ardmore, that's nice side. That's where I go take my kids to go play in the park and stuff like that, get, get that diversity in, right? So, me and this, um, me and this, I want to say she was f from the Middle East, not really sure. She, we was talking, small talk, and um, she asked me what the, what I did for a living, so I told her I was an artist. But I knew talking to this probably well-off woman, you know what I mean, um, that I had to show what I did. So, I already had my website already uploaded, boom, showed it to her, and then to, to show somebody what you do is like, that's where it pays off at. Cause to tell somebody 
You know, if you was to run into if you was to run into Mark Cuban and and, and he just tell you, oh yeah, I'm a I'm a businessman, and you don't know who Mark Cuban is, you wouldn't know. Oh snap, you you're the executive producer of Shark Tank, you're the owner of the the Dallas Mavericks, you you know what I mean, Fortune 500 company dude. So it's like sometimes you do have to show people your value, like your worth, and 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 instantly make people fans. You know what I mean within that first like. You know, first impression, so. My first art show was at the Urban Art Gallery on 52nd Street in Irvine in West Philadelphia. Um, the owner, Carl Fons Morris, really good friend of mine to this day. He's like family. Um, at the time when I was barbering on 52nd Street at Main Attraction Unisex Salon, um, I that's when I really started to break away from doing the barber artwork because a lot of uh, backtrack a little bit when I started winning competitions at these barber shows I started seeing the vending booths and I started seeing a lot of people sell t-shirts sell clippers sell combs or sell like some other product you know what I mean and it was consistent it was almost like a, a step and repeat you know what I mean throughout the whole show and I said you know I and I'm 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 very much an artist, but I'm also like business-wise too. So I'm walking around these shows and I'm winning, and I'm looking like, well, I wanna, I wanna make some money, but and I want, I was selling shirts for a little bit, but I was like, everybody's selling shirts. I gotta sell something different. And I said, nobody in, in here is selling any artwork. It's all these barbers, hair salon owners, barbershop owners in here, and there is no booth in here that people can buy some artwork for their, you know, their brick and mortar store. So I started dedicating at least like three or four years while barbering, just doing barber artwork. And now I've sold, I've sold thousands of pieces to people in all over the world. My website tracks and lets me know like where artwork is going. I've sell, I've, I've sent things to Africa, to Europe, to South America, Canada. Yeah. So, so once, once, once I got a taste of how my art could move, I started saying, okay, let me find my art voice outside of the barber artwork. Cause I love barbering and I saw that that was a niche that I could instantly go in there and fill. But I said, what's, what's my, what's my artwork going to do for the community that I'm in? And so my first art show that I put together, I think if I'm not mistaken, I, I want to say it was 2012, 2012, like right after my daughter was born. Um, at the Urban Art Gallery, it was very all over the place because I, I was just like, oh, I want to paint this, I want to paint that, I want to paint that. Um, I look back at it now and just say like, oh, this stuff is trash. But but um, the amount of love that I got was just like, it, it it's something, there's something fulfilling that money can't, money can't buy when it's like, you know, I created this. This is something that I had. This is a vision that I had and I made it tangible. I made it you know come to life and people it, it touches people you know what i mean it speaks to people it motivates people it inspires people and for me that feeling is 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 worth more than any amount of money um and ever since that show that's kind of what's been like feeding my passion just that um that that um you know, it's, it's just it's just that knowledge, knowing that people really feel um, moved by whatever it is that you know once lived up here is you now created and put it out in the world. So. So I see that you did a couple logos. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, what logos did you do? Barbers. Ooh. Um. Yeah. I've done, I've done main attractions. Uh, okay, so um, while I was doing the painting and the artwork I also made a name for myself doing a lot of barber logos salon logos I've done uh, Fahim's hand of precision logo I did uh, main attraction unisex salon logo I've done Jay Majors uh, from Connecticut his logo his personal logo I've done uh, a logo for Lena Pacini Pessinini well oh, god edit that out I think I'm butchering the name um is man, I've I've had to have done probably over a hundred logos 
for the barber community. I don't even know all the names. You know, I, it's, it's so crazy. Um, the new pieces that, um, that a lot of people are seeing, um, I kind of, you know, loosely named it Good Energy, Good Energy Only. Um, it kind of came, I'm, I'm preparing for my Art Basel show right now. I've, I've been doing Miami Art Basel for a couple years now. Um, it's, it's gotten really, really good reception. A lot of the people have been really supportive. I've sold like some really, really expensive pieces to date. Like, um, but, but a part of me felt like I wasn't, I wasn't representing myself or my community the, the best way. So while I was preparing, while I was preparing for Art Basel and I'm doing like a lot of new pieces and I'm just sitting there saying like, um, you know, at the end of the day, cause I'm always thinking about the future. At the end of the day, what is the estate going to look like for my kids when I'm, when I'm going? What artwork will they have in their possession that they can be proud of? And I really just, I, I just stopped. I just stopped creating a lot of the pieces that people know me for, like the Money Burger piece, a lot of these pieces that sit behind me, um, to really just sit there and say like, I want to make some artwork that my daughters are going to be proud of. I want to make some artwork that my mom, my aunt, my wife, my friends, because I got a lot of strong, strong, like beautiful, intelligent, like, like, you know, leveled up like women in my family and in my friends. And it just was like, you know what, the artwork that I was creating prior to that, it just didn't speak to, it just, it didn't speak to them. It didn't speak to, to, you know, my community. Um, I was getting to the bags, but it's like, I just, it didn't sit right. You know what I mean? So I just took a, a minute, put on some good music and just, I just created what was, what was in my heart. You know what I mean? And, um, and so I started painting these women and putting these abstract layers on top of them. I wanted to create the vibe. I wanted people to look at the artwork and say, that artwork make, makes me feel the same way my favorite song makes me feel. And, um, and so I, that's, that's, the, this, that's the latest pieces that I've created. I'm real, I feel really good. I feel really good about this, this body of work and I, I look forward to continuing more, more pieces. You know, uh, uh, so so a lot of people ask me how am I how am I this good and this humble, and it's honestly because it's like, at the end of the day, you know, you gotta just treat people good, man. Like, I and I and I, I learned, and this is one of the lessons that I learned from the barber community, because I remember when I was like rolling and I was hot and I was winning competitions, and I remember, I remember Nori, I remember Nori first approached me before I was hot. And he asked me, would I like to do, do designs or something for him? And I was like, no, I'm not doing no designs for you. I'm doing my own thing, da 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 And then I, I had to eat that humble pie because I realized how big Nori was and how impactful he was for the community. And and I had a couple of those, you know what I mean, you know, kicking the ass moments where I, I had to eat. I had to eat that pie. And and I realized that, you know, you, you get a lot further treating people well than acting like you bigger than somebody because you never know where life is going to take you. You know what I mean? I could, God forbid, I'd be on the street this time next year. You know what I mean? I, nobody, nobody knows. You know what I mean? Same way with, with you or who everybody, anybody that's out there, you never know what, what, you, what, what your destiny calls you to do or where you'll be at. So I just move about treating people well because it's, it's enough it's enough out here for everybody to eat and you eat well when everybody's eating together so so coming from behind the chair what it means to me everybody's a creator whether you in um this art that art hairstylist whatever you're a creator don't let that title define who you are because your your bigger title is creator and you can do so many more things from behind that chair you just got to have the faith and you got to be willing to get you get you know get your elbows dirty but um same way you know you are great behind the chair 
you if you if you are any bit of a creative you can be a, a, a great you know anything you 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 want to be so that's what that means to me